Ryan. If I might, Your Honor, I have a very brief procedural uh, issue I'd like to raise before we call our first witness. Um, as was decided Wednesday, I did file in writing uh, Ms. Hurt's motion to uh, subpoena Bruce Rastetter. It did not come through EFS until late in the day yesterday. And after that, my email server was uncooperative and refused to send the confidential version to Mr. Dublinsky for him to distribute to the other parties. Uh, so I talked with Mr. Dublinsky, and given that other parties only have two days to respond to that motion, we thought it made sense to treat it as if it was filed today for those purposes. And I appreciate uh, Ms. Ryan's uh, willingness to do that, and I am going to distribute it to the other parties here once I'm up and uh, have everything pulled up this morning. So um, the, we agree that counting starting today would be appropriate. I don't know that it makes a lot of difference because the counting rules, how the counting rules treat weekends, but I certainly appreciate the, uh, the courtesy. All right. Well, seeing no objections, I think that seems fitting. Appreciate the parties getting along and putting that together. Anything else before we get started? All right. Mr. Letter. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, some of the next witness that we'll call is Aaron DeJoya. Aaron DeJoya, who caused to be filed a written rebuttal testimony in this docket? I am. If I asked you those same questions today, would your answers be substantially the same? They would be. Uh, do you have any corrections or modifications to make to that written testimony today? No. Your Honor, we would move for the admission of Mr. DeJoya's uh, pre-filed pre rebuttal testimony. Thank you. Uh, other than Mr. Jordy's standing objection, do we have an objection? Seeing none, uh, will be admitted and given the weight due. We'll tender the witness for cross, Your Honor. Who's first? Ms. Grunhagen. I think everybody was waiting to see who was going to go first. <laughs> I think everybody was waiting to see who was going to go first. I know there was a lot of looking around. <laughs> this morning. Good morning, Mr. DeJoya. Um, Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Gurren-Hagen, and I'm representing the Iowa Farm Bureau in these proceedings. And I have a few questions for you this morning. Uh, but first, um, could you explain what, you, what your role is with the Summit Pipeline Project? My role with the Summit Pipeline Project, there's two of them. One is to provide technical assistance with soils and reclamation across the entire project area. Um, and then the additional role is I'm also leading the team that is doing topsoil sampling throughout the entire alignment in Iowa. So you're, you're based in Colorado? I am based in Colorado, okay. correct. So you're making frequent trips up here to Iowa then? I make trips up to Iowa. Depends what you call frequent, but yes, I make trips. <laughs> Very good. Um, on page three of your testimony, your rebuttal testimony, uh, line 22 to 25, uh, you indicated that you developed a uh, topsoil sampling protocol for the Dakota Access Project. I did. Is that correct? Um, did Dakota Access use your protocol? Dakota Access used my protocol, correct. Okay. 
And then on uh, page four, uh, starting on line 23, uh, you described that you were one of the individuals who provided technical assistance uh, to the Iowa Utilities Board in developing the current rules, is that correct? I provided assistance through another consultant um, and provided them my input. They took it to the IUB. I never spoke personally to the IUB about those. And it was a different board at that time? It, yes, it was. Yeah. Okay. Um, to my, sorry, to the best of my understanding. Um, are the board's current rules in large part similar to that protocol you developed? I would say they are similar, but there are some differences that um, I would recommend different based on the science and technology available. What are those differences? Could you identify them? A couple of them. The one that is probably the most um, difficult is the compaction testing and currently in the IUB chapter 9 rules they're asking for what is called an SPT compaction method testing and that's more of an engineering standard an engineering way of measuring compaction almost to the point of making sure there's enough compaction to build something what I would suggest the IUB change is to use more of an agricultural method, which is called a comb penetrometer method. And it is similar to the methods that are, were used by Iowa State in their study that's referenced in my report and other people's reports, also referenced, um, is, was used in the Ohio State studies that were referenced in my um report and others reports. So it's just a different method. It's much more practical for the field situation than the SPT method, which is, like I said earlier, engineering standard. And there's better agricultural standards that could be used to provide the exact same information at a much um, more logistically capable um, methodology. Now, both of the things you just talked about, that's reg regarding the compaction standards, right? That is regar regarding the compaction okay. standard, correct. And that, that's not the topsoil survey? That's not the topsoil survey. Okay, so let's go back to the topsoil survey um, itself. Are there any differences between what you recommended for protocols for the topsoil survey and what the board has in their rules? Yeah, my recommendation for the topsoil survey would... I. First off, let me say I really like the idea of making sure that every parcel has at least one or two sampling points on it. It makes for a better method, um, better data. Um, and then the one thing I would change if we had the opportunity to is collecting three points, one on each side of the right way. From a soil science perspective, that doesn't provide any additional value for how we finally come up with the topsoil map and in all actuality I have ran some of the data we've collected here and there is statistically no difference between if I just use one of the points versus using the three in the transect points to determine that so it's kind of a it, it makes us spend more time in the field without adding any value or scientific data value to that collection system so you're arguing that only one sample is necessary in a field? One sample per transect, but every field should be at least two. I agree with that. And that the 500 feet, every 500 feet, um, in some states we do 750, some states we do fewer than 500. So 500 is a good number to start with to have maximum distance between points. I can't complain about that one way or the other, but having to take three, three samples within 20 feet from a soil science perspective, that's just um, doesn't provide any extra value from there. Soils don't change that fast. Does it make the topsoil survey inaccurate to take that third sample? N no, it doesn't make it any more inaccurate. It just doesn't add any accuracy versus just taking one sample. And the data that we've collected proves that out, but 
we're taking three samples at every transect when we're out there because that's what the IUB has decided is the correct method for Iowa. And so we're just following that rule, doing everything that we're asked to do on that. So is the topsoil survey protocol that you developed for Dakota Access and used have very similar results to the protocols established by the board for doing topsoil surveys? The Dakota Access Survey, what it has very similar results, was not very different. The only thing that I believe, and we learned from Dakota Access, or I learned from Dakota Access, is yes, we do need um, a minimum of two samples per um, landowner in a situation so that we always have something to compare to to make sure we don't have too big of anomalies based on how a farmer practices change. Okay. Um, you list that there are some changes in the board's rules overall um, between what occurred during Dakota Access and what is currently in the rules on uh, page four of the testimony? Correct. Okay. So I believe we've already discussed um, C on line 10 um, but is, haven't the rules always required, um, at least for decades, the separation of topsoil from subsoil? They, the rules, as far as I know, um, back in Dakota Access and today, they both require segregation of topsoil and subsoil, correct? And that it's always required um, separation of the storage areas as well? That... I can only speak back to Dakota Access. I didn't I'll know clear. up to that time. So yes, from that point forward, they have, to my knowledge. And hasn't there also been a requirement since before Dakota Access that the subsoil be placed back in the trench first and then the topsoil on top? That is how I understand the rules and how I interpret the rules. Okay. Um, um, are you aware also that um, that there's also been a requirement that the storage of the topsoil and the subsoil has to have enough separation so that they don't mix? That is my understanding of the rules, correct. Okay. Um, uh, during Dakota Access, um, during that project, um, was the topsoil um, by and large removed to the depth identified by your topsoil survey protocols? unless the easement, I guess it qualifier, unless the easement or the line sheet said otherwise? To my understanding and based on my review of all the agricultural inspection reports that were out there, I would say that 90 to 95% of the time, topsoil was segregated correctly and separated from subsoil correctly. Was it 100%? I couldn't say that, but it was very high 90s percent. 90 or better percent. Is there always some human error kind of mixed in with this and judgment? There is always human error and judgment, and that happens on every project, and we have to deal with that from a reclamation perspective during the reclamation process, and that's why people like Dakota Access and now Summit have uh, retained services of soil scientists, reclamation scientists, to help them through this process of when things don't go directly as we anticipated, which happens on every construction project. Um, you indicated when we first started talking here this morning that um, you're going to be conducting or overseeing the topsoil surveys for the summit project? That is correct. Okay. Um, have you established a process by which you're going to be sharing those survey topsoil survey results with the landowners? We are. We have a process where we have developed tables and figures inside of our database to provide that information to Summit per landowner, and I would have to. I do not know how Summit or if Summit will distribute that data to individual landowners. But my final delivery product will have tables and figures per landowner per track for each track that we have 
taking soil samples on, which will be all the tracks along the alignment. So you're not responsible with interacting with the landowners regarding your topsoil survey? Is that what I'm understanding? Not. Uh, we have interacted with landowners just from them coming out why people have been walking and taking soil samples. But day to day, no, we are not responsible for interacting with the landowners on that data at this time. You know, but we aren't done with the survey, so we have not started to distribute any data even to um, Summit as, as of today because we don't have the final deliverable ready for that. So who at Summit do you report to or do you give the samples to? I report to Grant Terry. Okay. And do you know who at Summit is going to be providing those uh, results to the landowners? I do not. Because we've asked of, asked of previous witnesses, and, and I believe they referred us to you. So we'll we'll continue to find, figure yeah, it out. Yeah, I will provide it to Summit, and then they're responsible for providing it, or under my understanding, to individual landowners. Okay. Um, on line 16, uh, there on page 4, you also list as a, a change is the compaction requirements. And I, I think you've described that already. Um, so I'll... Uh, kind of skip that part, but um, have you are you familiar with um, sub, Summit's um, Ag Impact Mitigation Plan? Yes. Uh, did you contribute to that or review it? I reviewed it, yes, but I did not have a acting part of putting that together. Okay. Um, do you also recall uh, Dakota Access's um, Ag Impact Mitigation Plan? Yes, I do. Okay. Did you also review that, or did you contribute to that? I reviewed and provided comments back to that one. Okay. Do you know what, if any, differences there are in the decompaction requirements in the Ag Impact Mitigation Plan for Summit as compared to the Ag Impact Mitigation Plan for Dakota Access? I, <laughs> the Dakota Access was a long time ago and okay. I don't I couldn't say if there was or was not any differences between the two I'm sorry okay um, well why don't we have the board pull up um, the Dakota access ag impact mitigation plan and let's just st stay on the first can you scroll down a little bit just so they can see the filing st I'm sorry scroll up I said the wrong way scroll up so they can see the filing stamp um, what was the date that this was filed with the, the utilities board according to what's on the screen in front of me it's April 14th of 2016 okay. would that have been slightly prior to the construction beginning I believe so okay. um, can you please scroll down uh, to page uh, bottom of page 11 6.8 What is the title of that section? 6.8 reads, Restoration After Soil Compaction and Rutting. Okay. Could you go ahead and just and read that paragraph? It's just a couple of, it's just a few sentences. Yes. In accordance with Chapter 9, Paragraph 9.4, parentheses 4, in parentheses, comma, Agricultural Land Compacted by Heavy Project Equipment, including off right of way access roads will be deep tilled to alleviate soil compaction upon completion of construction on the property in areas where topsoil was removed tillage will proceed replacement of topsoil excuse me can you scroll that up a little bit so you can see that thank you okay you can, you can continue Continuing, um, at least three passes of deep tillage equipment shall be made per chapter 9.4, parentheses, 4, in parentheses, A, in parentheses. Tillage shall be at least 18 inches deep in land used for 
crop production and 12 inches deep on other lands. Parentheses, except where shallow tile systems are encounter, encountered in parentheses and shall be performed under soil moisture conditions which permits effective working of the soil if agreed in advance, this tillage may be performed by the landowners or tenants using their own equipment, period. Um, and then go ahead and read the, the last paragraph. There's two more sentences. Rutted land will be graded and tilled until restored as near as practical to its pre-construction condition. On lands where topsoil was removed, rutting will be remedied before topsoil is replaced. Is that consistent with your recollection of what that may have, what that said for the Dakota Access uh, Pipeline Project? That was in 2016, so I'm believing this is the okay. correct document, and it's okay. to the best of my recollection, yes. All right, why don't we go ahead and switch to Summit's um, Ag, Ag Impact Mitigation Plan, just so we can compare them. And, and what's the filing date on this one? According to the document, it's August 22nd, 2023. Okay. And then if we could go ahead and scroll down to page 12. Okay. Uh, go ahead. We're right there. Um, section 6.9. What is the title of that? restoration after soil compaction and rutting. Okay. I'll go ahead and give you a minute to read through that yourself and then um, and then we can talk for a little bit about that a little bit, okay? Does that look remarkably similar to the sim, to the provision on restoration after soil compaction that you just read through on the Dakota Access Ag Impact Mitigation Plan? They are similar, um, but there are slight differences in them. Yes. Um, so would it surprise you that really the only difference is the language about halfway through the paragraph where it says shall be performed under soil moisture conditions? that result in the maximum standard penetration test reading, which you indicated earlier was the, ch was the change? That is the, that's a large substantial difference between the two, yes. Okay. And then the other difference is where it says decompaction shall not occur in wet conditions. That's, I that believe sentence. the other one had some language about wet conditions, but this puts it very it's in the clear. forefront, okay. yes. So it was prohibited before, but this is very clear language. Yes, correct. So the primary difference between the two plans then is just the standard maximum standard penetration test. Everything else is the same. Yep, and more clearly identifying that decompaction can't be done in wet conditions. Okay, thank you. Um, so on uh, page, and so let's go back to your rebuttal testimony. On page six of your rebuttal testimony, starting on line 23, you discuss um, mechanical decompaction. Correct. In that sentence there. Um, and then you also talk about um, deep ripping as the implement used to decompact the soil prior to backfilling. Is that correct? I say mechanical decompaction of subsoil prior to backfilling topsoil. Okay. So what are the implements that are used to accomplish mechanical decompaction? There are different implements available out there. There are what the underverth, V-E-R-T-H, um, type of rippers and also the parabolic rippers. 
and both of those are standard agricultural equipment that are designed explicitly for mechanical decompaction of fields. Uh, for the record, can you roughly explain the difference between the two types? Um, they're, the main difference is the shape of the shank. One, as the parabolic ripper is, is more of a U-shaped tillage device, lifts and shatters the soil. The underverth is a very is a little bit different style of ripper. Does exactly the same thing, but it's just a different design. It's more of a straight shank that lifts and shatters the soil. Okay, so both of them have an iron shank that will go through the soil, knife through the soil, essentially. They both have a shank that will go into the soil. The important thing to know, and this is why it's critical that the IUB has put in the wet conditions clarifier and made it more appropriate, is that in wet conditions, those will just, like you said, will just knife through the soil. But in drier conditions, they will actually pick the soil up. You'll see a wave in the soil conditions. It'll pick it up, shatter the soil, and keep it make more places for roots and water to penetrate the soil. So there's a, that's one of the critical elements of having this wet condition um, stipulation in your rules is so that we can ensure that we get that shattering of the soil instead of just knifing through it like a uh, knife through butter. Are there any other types of implements that can be used for mechanical decompaction? Those are the two most standard ones, the ones I've seen most often used on right-of-ways. I am sure there are others, but those are the most common and the ones that I would recommend out there. Okay. So do you know of any others? I, I mean, people try to use the back end of a grader, the rippers on the back of a grader, they're different implements. So those are not adequate for this. I, I don't want to say n no, because as soon as I stop, step off the stand, I'll remember one, but not off the top of my head. Okay. Well, if you remember one while you're up there, I will. It would be helpful. To those are the two that. major types though. Okay. Thank you. Um, if the soil has been, uh, and I'll say, use the word severely, and I know it's a qualitative word, but uh, it's been severely compacted such that it's hard, like, and I'll just use the word concrete as a layperson. Um, will that ripper still do its job or will it just cut a line through the, through the dirt? The interesting thing about these rippers is if you get them into the ground and that will be the hardest thing when it's like concrete is to get them into the ground the harder they are the more shattering that will take place however during that process of making it hard you've disrupt a lot of the soil structure so it's critical that after you rip that you give that soil time to heal and for soil to build back structure in there and that's done through root mass that's done through time that's done through water going in and out of the system um, and that's why when I talk to farmers about this is they always want to help the reclamation process by bringing in manure or some other um, organic material and really those pieces of equipment are so heavy when they bring in that they actually compact the soil again so the farmer is trying to help doing the best he has for his normal fields and fields that haven't been constructed on. But when they bring this added equipment onto the site, it actually de recompacts some of that soil that we have left there. So them performing extra help for us doesn't help us. We just want them to be from a rec reclamation and restoration process, just continue to do what they do outside the right of way on the right of way and that will prevent that will help that soil heal as fast as possible it's it's a process it's not an overnight um deal 
as some people would want it to be, but it's a process that takes years or, you know, two to three years to do. So I'm going to unpack a little bit of that and with some follow-up questions mm -hmm. to that. So when you talk about heavy equipment applying manure, are you familiar with umbilical hose equipment? Yes. Okay. And you do you believe that to be too heavy to be applying manure in the farm? It, it's an extra pass on this. I want them to treat their, their field exactly the same as a farmer across the entire right of way. Mm -hmm. Any extra passes are not, are, don't add value to the reclamation process. Give us a couple years. At that point, then you can do some of these other reclamation processes that they have to build that soil back up if it needs it. Most of the time, if we go through the right processes and we follow the steps that are in the AIMP, reclamation will be successful. If we start adding processes to it, as in um, adding manure, knifing in extra stuff, if it's not done absolutely at the right time with the right processes, it could actually set the reclamation process negative. So therefore, when I talk to farmers about their restoration on their project, I'm like, pretend like the pipeline never went in for the first two years and just treat it as part of your other field. Yes, it's going to have some, especially in year one, some reduced crop growth. But don't, don't try and help right off the bat because that soil needs, it's kind of like a broken arm. It needs some time to heal before you can start doing other things with it and strengthening again. It's got to take, it's a process. Don't just treat it like everything else. So if a farmer ordinarily applies some amount of fertilizer across their field, you're not saying they shouldn't be doing that, are you? No, I'm saying do exactly on the right of way as you do in the rest of your field. If you buy manure, I'm not going to tell you not to apply manure. I'm going to say, but if you only apply to the right of way, that's what I don't want you to do because I want you to treat the whole field as one okay. when we get back. Okay. And what you're saying is the soil will naturally recondition itself without additional help. Is that what you're saying? When we follow the reclamation plans that are laid out in the I, AIMP, we are going to get back to full productivity. We're going to be able to return that soil. It's not going to happen overnight. It takes one, two, maybe three years for it to get back there. But it's part of the process. It's a process. It's not a, you can't jump it. If, that, if the soil um, was hard like concrete because of the compaction, is it going to take longer to recover? It should not take longer. We may add extra. One of the things that has really come into um, knowledge within the farming community, reclamation people have known it a little bit longer, is the use of cover crops. On something that's very hard like concrete, I would say, Let's get cover crops on that as quickly as possible. Let us put cover crops on, on your parcel. Roots are the best thing for the soil to repair itself. And those roots are clover roots, um, turnip roots, corn roots, soybean roots, whatever roots. The soil is a living mechanism and we need to feed it again. We've dis disrupt some of that. Now we're going to put it back and it re the process is very quick because you're getting the surrounding. Nothing has died. It just needs fed. It just needs to be healed. And again, I go back to the breaking your arm. It needs a little bit of time. It needs a cast, cover crops, to get it back to full productivity. If you give it the right time, you give it time to heal, it's going to be able to throw a baseball just like it was before or grow a crop just like it was before. So the restoration is, and just like broken arm, it takes a little bit of time to get back to that stage. 
has the, your recommendation of cover crops, have you, has that been the recommendation of the reclamation industry for quite some time, or is that something that's developed over the, over the last few years? Um, that was, it was really coming, just starting to be a big impact right before Dakota Access was built, and we offered that. Um, I, I, we tried to push that with farmers as part of that AIMP. I think farmers have realized the importance of soil microbial activity, soil health since that time, so they're much more accepting of those practices now than they were there. I know I was, you know, a lot of farmers didn't want cover crops when we came through Dakota Access. They just asked not to have it, which was disappointing because I knew that could actually improve the reclamation process. But again, we can't force landowners to follow everything we do. It is a highly recommended on my end that cover crops are included as part of the restoration process, especially if, re if the pipeline's done being constructed, say June, and we aren't gonna plant corn back on there until the following May. We please let me get that microbial activity started again. Let me put those cover crops on there. Let's get that going back again. And I think that Summit is in agreement with that is cover crops are important and they have that as part of their bigger picture of how to get this restoration to occur. So if the soil is so compacted that it's hard like concrete, we'll just use that mm -hmm. phraseology, um, what what else could be done other than cover crops to help repair, repair and restore that? The first step is to mechanically decompact it. The next step is to, the next best thing after mechanical decompaction is forage radishes, turnips, those types of brassicus crops that have very deep rooted, big decompacting um, root systems and they will go down, break that soil apart, keep it open because it's going to want to come back together. It keeps it open while the next grass crop that's also growing in that cover crop mix comes in, starts building that st structure, adds organic matter to it, and then able to redo that. Come in, plant your cash crop, corn, soybean, mostly around here, and then that will start the process all over again. Other than what you've described, what else could be done? Those are the primary items. I mean, you can deep rip it the next year, which I don't recommend um, unless it needs it. That's based on how growth is going. Monitoring is the next best thing. I mean, these soils, if the reclamation process is done and deep mechanical deep ripping is done appropriately at the right time, it will break that up. Then you follow that up with cover crops. The compaction will not reoccur unless someone decides to run a honey wagon across it or some use it as a roadway during harvest systems or something like that. If they treat it as one complete field, just like they have all the other times, it will heal over time. So if growth continues to be a problem four, five, six years down the road, um, then what do you recommend? Then we, if growth is a problem four, five, six down, years down the road, hopefully they, the landowner has engaged Summit before that and we aren't four, five, six years down the road, we're three, four years down the road. We come in, identify what is limiting yield, is it compaction? Is it fertility? Is it hydrology? Identify what's limiting yields, fix that. Maybe it would require more decompaction if it's compaction related. Maybe it will need to be lime. Maybe it will need to be fertilizer. Maybe it wasn't graded quite right and we need to fix a few little holes out there that occurred or settling that occurred. This fix what the problem is, go out and get that reclamation correct at that point. 
So you just mentioned settling that's occurred. Um, if settling has occurred in the easement area such that the grade of the easement area is lower than the rest of the field, would, do you recommend then going back in and, and regrading that to make it level? I would recommend that we take a um, parcel by parcel evaluation of it and determine what's the best method. Sometimes regra regrading is most of the time the right answer, but there's other answers of um, bringing in a little bit of topsoil, bringing in some compost. What is, what's it look like? It's all site specific. And those issues would need to be addressed on a site specific, hopefully earlier in the process than later, because I'd rather have these farmers return to yields after you, you hope, you know, going through the process, three years, they should be back to 100% yield. That's the goal for every farmer on the project. But if it, in year four, they don't have 100% yield, I would hope that Summit would answer the phone, the farmer would call first, Summit would answer the phone, they'd get someone like myself or another reclamation scientist out there to evaluate what the issue is, fix the issue, and hopefully in year five they would be back to full productivity. But I, I don't, I think the farmers and Summit need to understand is that the sooner we attack the issue, the faster we can fix it, the m faster the farmers back to not having to worry about these issues anymore. So if someone is still having yield issues with Dakota Access, I believe there was a, a landowner that uh, testified here uh, within the last couple of weeks showing a yield map um, indicating that you could still see the pipeline from Dakota Access. And so in those kinds of instances, um, what you're recommending is there's still something going on there and there, the company needs to be recontacted. Is that what you're recommending? That's what I would recommend, and I have no information on Dakota Access. I understand. So, just using that as an example. Yes, they should contact Dakota Access, and in my opinion, Dakota Access should investigate it. Okay. And similarly with Summit, if there continues to be yield issues, um, the landowner should contact Summit. That would be my suggestion, and. If Summit doesn't answer the phone, they should have a, someone that, within the state to call and be able to make Summit or Dakota Access respond to their complaints. And I believe that these companies, more times than that, want to solve, be a landowner, be cooperative with their landowners because they're all one community at the end of the day. And so getting back to 100% is the goal of the whole project, of, of the reclamation. Returning yields to 100% of the rest of the field is the goal, yes. But whether it actually achieves that goal is kind of a field by field look at it. Every field could have issues. Every field responds differently. As we go through here, I've seen some, very few fields, if any, have ever responded back to 100% yield in year one. I've seen multiple fields, many fields, return to 100% productivity in year two, and a vast majority, 75% or more, be back to full productivity in three years on that. But it's possible that 100% of the fields are not back to normal after three years. That is a possibility, yes. Um, you also talked some about uh, wet conditions on uh, page four, line nine, that there's a new definition of wet conditions. Um, and I'll say, cause since your reference is Dakota Access, um, hasn't there also been restrictions for several decades on constructing in wet conditions? Yes, under my knowledge, there has been conditions on working in wet conditions, correct? And haven't there been rules uh, 
again, you know, prior to Dakota Access even a requiring decompaction on the traveled way of the easement? There have been rules regarding that decompaction should be done in different areas of the right of way before this project, yes. Um, and like we, we talked about um, earlier with the compaction issues, um, do you know what, if any, differences there are in the wet conditions provisions in Summit's Ag Impact Mitigation Plan um, as compared to the Dakota Access Ag Impact Mitigation Plan? I do. I can't remember the exact differences in those, but there are differences in what's being the definition of wet conditions, yes. And you did identify that there is a defi different definition of wet conditions, but the f but my question is, is the wet conditions requirements, were they still the same between the two? Here, why don't we just look at it? Um, yeah, please. Okay. Um, can you, we go back to Dakota Access Ag Impact Mitigation Plan? And then it's on page 13, section 6.14. Okay. Um, could you go ahead and just read that out loud? Yes. Um, 6.14, construction in wet conditions. In accordance with chapter nine, paragraph 9.4, parentheses 10, in parentheses, construction in wet soil conditions will not commence or continue at times when or locations where the passage of heavy construction equipment may cause rutting to the extent that the topsoil and subsoil are mixed or underground drainage structures may be damaged. To facilitate construction in soft soils, DAPL may elect to remove and stockpile the topsoil from the traveled way install mats or padding, or use other methods acceptable to minimize rutting or offsite erosion slash sedimentation. And in that paragraph, DAPL is Dakota Access Pipeline? That is how I understand it, yes. Okay, uh, thank you for doing that. And could you go ahead and switch back to the Summit Egg Impact Mitigation Plan that was filed on August 22nd? And that is on page 14. So just scroll down a little bit more there. Section 6.15, okay. Now the, um, the first paragraph is new, um, but you, could you go ahead and read the uh, second two paragraphs to yourself? And then when you're done, we'll chat. In, in the the third paragraph of that section, SCS is Summit Carbon Solutions? Is that that is correct, SCS. Okay. That's how I understand it, yes. Okay. Are the second and third paragraphs uh, substantially similar to what you read for the Dakota Access AIMP? They are similar. Okay. Um, and then the, the first paragraph is different. Um, would you like to go ahead and read that to yourself and then we can talk about that? I'm done. Okay. And so what does that paragraph essentially require or do? In, in my opinion is that that provides the county inspector um, greater authority than previously provided to determine and to work with the construction crews to halt construction during what they're calling wet conditions in here. Okay. And so as far as the AIMP plans for um, construction and wet conditions, are there any differences 
uh, substantively other than the county inspector authority? There are limited differences, but I believe the county, having the county inspector having that kind of authority provides huge value. I would agree with you. Okay, on um, page nine, let's go back to your rebuttal testimony. We're still on the same subject, but in page, on page nine, um, at the bottom of the page, uh, that carries, it starts, uh, summit, scroll up just a little bit more, please, so that we can see the first part of the, bottom of page nine, top of page 10, if we can see that sentence, okay. Can you read the, sent the sentence that start with starts with Summit Carbon on line 26 and going on to page 10? Yes. That sentence reads, Summit Carbon should be allowed to re return to construction activity once the right-of-way, ROW, has limited, parentheses, less than 30% in parentheses, of the right-of-way with standing water. This will protect the environmental resource. That's, that's, that's okay. okay. I just wanted that sentence. Yep. Um, doesn't it say greater than 30% in the parentheses? I think you read less than. You are correct. Okay. Is that a typo? That would be a typo. I apologize. Okay. okay. That sentence didn't make a lot of sense with it greater <laughs> yeah. than, and that's it, why I wanted to ask yes. about that. So I would request that my um, testimony here be changed when we get an opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And, and so uh, considering if it does say less than 30% of the right of way, um, why are you suggesting that the um, requirements be changed to allow Summit to construct when there's 30% standing water in the right of way? There, there are a couple reasons for this. One is there's a lot of different construction processes that go on during a construct a pipeline construction um, construction those include everything from welding to laying pipe to bending pipe to all that some of those have a lot of traffic some of those have very little traffic um, and all of those can be done, cannot be done, depending on weather conditions and how much water is there. There's, during certain times of the year, we're going to have some standing water on the right of way in different portions that shouldn't shut down the whole spread or the whole right of way, in my opinion. The more important fact of this is that if we're not allowed, if construction is not allowed to continue. My fear from a crop, soil protective, environmental resource protection is that the longer soils stay out of place, being that the topsoil is off and stockpiled, the greater chance we have for erosion, for microbial activity to be decreased, for other processes to occur that then create other challenges for reclamation. Compaction is one challenge. Um, you know, damage to drain tiles is another challenge, but I believe that the IEB did a good job in improving the language around drain tiles and protecting drain tiles and repairing drain tiles. Those are all other issues. But you also have to look at the whole project as a whole and how long is topsoil going to be stored to the side. How fast can we get that back? How fast can we return that land back to the farmer so they can start growing crops on it again? All those things have to be looked at. So I understand, and I was trying to come up with a method here of how the inspectors who are asking for more clarity and the right away, you know, where can we determine what conditions? And this was one method to do that that allows a very quantitative 
process, more quantitative than the term wet, but still allow construction to occur, still allow us to get the project executed, which then returns the land back to the farmer as quickly as possible so that their rest restoration on that piece of property can occur and they're back to full productivity faster. So trying to come up with that process and how we get everyone through those transects so we're not on the same landowner for six weeks if it happens to start raining. We can keep progressing forward in a manner that is protective of all the resources, subsoil, topsoil, um, drain tile, erosion, all that, microbial activity. If there's ponding on land, does, doesn't that mean the, uh, the soil is already saturated because it's not soaking into the soil? It could mean that the soil is already compacted. It could mean that the soil is saturated. It could mean that that's where all the, that just that area is saturated because there was a depression area there. So there's a lot of different reasons. You, your saturation is one of many and it probably is saturated and a depression at the same time, but those are all different aspects. And so you're suggesting that construction continue even though the, the ground's compacted or it's already saturated? The, the thing that we have to remember through Iowa is there are many soil types that have what we call a BG, big B, small g, horizon, and that G tells us that that soil goes through many wetting and drying cycles and through portions of the soil or portions of the active growing season, the G doesn't stand for this, there's some other soil um, classification terms we use for it, but during portions of the growing season and non-growing season, those soils are saturated naturally. So if we just used saturation, there are parts of this project, we take the topsoil off and may have to wait six months for the soil to dry underneath, under if you're using just saturation as a predictor. And so that's why we just, sometimes we're going to have to do construction on soil that is has a water content around field capacity. And that is what we have to do because construction, it doesn't get less than field capacity until the fall of the year. In those situations, we have to deal with the ramifications of that or the the construction team has to deal with the ramifications of that, which it means more diesel spin on decompaction, more times might need to be, it might need to be ripped because we have the um, rule in there that says we have to be under 300 PSI. I have some different language I'm sure you're gonna ask me about later, but we'll just go with what's in there, 300 PSI. That is the protection we're using to allow construction to happen during non-optimal times of the year. And that's how we're going to get construction through these certain areas and put that farmland back into production and allow for continuation for that land to be returned back to 100% productivity. So. There are, what's good about the IUB process and the rules and regulations around this is there's checks and balances many places along the process to return this. Are we going to be 100% on 